Good evening. I'm Kim McCleary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. It's my great pleasure to introduce you all to tonight's live stream as a kickoff to our 2022 Los Angeles Mayoral Series program. This evening's discussion between political professor Dan Schnur, who's joining me right now, and NBC Channel 4's political reporter Conan Nolan will address the challenges faced and to be faced by the incoming Los Angeles mayor. Issues such as homelessness, crime, inflation, and COVID recovery will be at the forefront of voters' minds prior to the primary this June. This launches this phenomenal monthly interview program that Dan will be doing. So Dan, why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about what they can expect starting in February? Oh, Kim, thanks so much for having me. And thanks so much to all of you for joining us for, as Kim said, the kickoff in this really exciting series. Um, as all of you know, or as many of you know, um, I've had the privilege of hosting a webinar along with Kim um, on uh, state and local and national politics. Boy, almost two years now. But one of the things that Kim and Jessica and Claire and I all talked about late last year was putting together a parallel series that focused somewhat more specifically on a series of challenges that we're facing here in Los Angeles. Now, I know that a lot of our participants are from other places in California and other parts of the country. And if you're with us tonight, I think you'll find it interesting nonetheless. And I think, and I hope you'll come back throughout the series. Because even though we'll be talking about the candidates, the men and women running for mayor of Los Angeles over the next several months, the issues they're facing, as Kim mentioned, issues of crime, issues of homelessness, issues of immigration, issues of healthcare, so many other public policy challenges faced by cities across the country. And so our hope is, is that if you're an Angelino, you'll be with us once a month to hear from the men and women who hope to lead our city going forward. But if you are from elsewhere, we think you'll get a lot of it also. Hearing how a really smart group of individuals who are aspiring to be the mayor of Los Angeles want to take on challenges that we're facing as a city, just like many of you are in your, in your own communities. So, Next month, to kick this all off, and with any luck, and Kim, you can give us some guidance on this. If uh, the coronavirus uh, gods allow it, our plan is, our hope is, is to be back in person for the next in the series on February 15th, when I'll be interviewing City Council Member Joe Biscayeno, um, who, if those of you who are not familiar with him, has really been a rising star on the City Council in recent years, and now, of course, is running for Mayor of Los Angeles. In March, we'll, in March, we'll be joined by Mike Fuhrer, the city attorney. I got to know Mike when he was a member of the California State Assembly. Incredibly intelligent man and a very formidable candidate as well. We're currently in negotiations with U.S. Representative, the campaigns of U.S. Representative Karen Bass and City Council Member Kevin DeLeon, uh, as well as potential other candidates as well. And so what our hope is, is that over the course of the spring, which we now in the mayoral primary, which will take place in the first week of June, that on about a once a month basis, we'll be able to bring one of Los Angeles' mayoral candidates to you for a series of in-depth conversations. And what we'll do in these programs, as we've done in the past when we've had guests, is I'll take moderator's rights to kick off the conversation and spend the first portion as I will tonight in conversation for probably you know, 20, 30 minutes or so with our guest, But then we'll get to what I think is not just my favorite, but the most important part of the program when we begin to take your questions. And both myself and our guest, whether it's an astute political journalist like Conan Nolan tonight, or one of the mayoral candidates later in the spring, we'll both do everything we can to address the questions that you, ha that, that you have for us. I see that we've been joined by Conan Nolan. Um, and I don't know if Conan can hear us yet. <laughs> you there with us, Yes, Conan? I can hear you, Dan. Uh, gre yes, greetings from uh, Ted Kaczynski's cabin. 
uh, in uh, the Mendocino uh, Red Redwoods. Uh, sorry, I'm late. Wi-Fi is a little spotty here, um, but I see you got us off to a good start. Okay, well, Welcome, we're really ready. Kim, thank you so much for the warm introduction. As always, we're happy to have you. We'll see you again at the end of the program. Thanks, Kim. Conan, it's great to have you. Um, I was just telling our audience that, in my mind, this is the broadest and deepest mayoral field that we've seen in Los Angeles in many, many years. Uh, Joe Viscaino is joining us for our next program in February. Mike Fear the month after that. We're in the process of finalizing Kevin Bass and Kevin DeLeon um, for later in the spring. I'd be interested, just to get us started, if you wouldn't mind giving us your overall impressions of the field as it's currently configured. Uh, you know, I was just having a conversation with Bill Carrick, your friend, uh, Democratic consultant. He is a candidate in the race. And um, one of the observations he made, which I think is, is so true, and it goes to your point, in so many of the mayoral races that we've had in the past, uh, when it was Antonio Virgosa and Jim Hahn, Wendy Gruel, uh, Eric Garcetti, um, we sort of knew who the primary candidates were going to be. Um, we knew it, it was it was a matchup of two individuals. This is an open field, to your point. Uh, it's a, a far more diverse field than we've had in the past. And even even some of the lesser known candidates uh, have a shot. Uh, and, and so I, you, you do hear, obviously, when Congresswoman Karen Bass, she has a national profile, uh, highly respected and she got into the race, she became the front runner immediately. Kevin DeLeon uh, had an impressive campaign against uh, the uh, incumbent U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein when he ran against her, uh, former Senate President Pro Tem of the California State Senate, uh, like Karen Bass, like Antonio Viragosa before uh, her, had uh, spent time in the legislature and as a result of term limits had to find another uh, vehicle uh, to public office, and that was through City Hall. Mike Fewer has been interested in running for for mayor since he was on the council, probably before then. Uh, he uh, has had a, a, a difficult road uh, as a result of some of the DWP incidents uh, and an FBI investigation. And Joe Biscano, I believe, is somebody who represents one of the last few Republicans. I don't think he's a registered Republican anymore, but uh, he, I think he be believes that there's such frustration when it comes to the homeless crisis that there is a there's a desire for something. And to his point, he doesn't. Most people don't want a 10 point plan anymore uh, when it comes to homelessness. And and I, I must say, Karen Bass the other day had a news conference where she talked about her plan for homelessness. And the L.A. Times pointed out that much of her rhetoric was very similar to what we've heard before. Or she talked about we need a FEMA response. Well, we've heard that before. We need a, it needs to. This is an emergency. Well, it was in 2000. What year was it? I'm, I'm forgetting now. 2016, 2015, when the Eric R. City and I was there, and uh, Herb Wesson held a news conference on the South Lawn of City Hall talking about this is an emergency. We have to do something immediately. Spend a hundred million dollars for it. So the public has heard this rhetoric, and the question is, Joe Biscano, I believe. Um, it believes that they're tired of it, and and they um, they want somebody who speaks in a different uh, with a different cadence to this. And then, of course, there's the the candidate everybody wonders whether or not he'll be running is Rick Caruso. He has hired A. Smith. This is the son of Arlo Smith. If anybody remembers Arlo Smith, uh, Democratic uh, uh, politician from Northern California. A. Smith is the is the Democratic consultant who runs Gavin Newsom, Kamala Harris's campaign. He worked on behalf of Hillary Clinton. He's uh, a, a top shelf uh, political consultant, and he's been hired by uh, Mr. Caruso um, ostensibly to figure out whether or not there's an avenue for him or whether or not this is worth his uh, w whether he has a shot. Uh, I personally believe that you don't hire A. Smith unless you plan on running. And so uh, we've heard that that's that he will make a decision sometime soon. Well, let's come back to Caruso. Uh, but, uh, so, so that's the unknown. And the, and the go ahead. So let's come back to Caruso in a minute because you're right. His entry into the race would certainly upend it. And I was talking just before you came on about the parallels between his potential candidacy 
in Dick Reardon's candidacy back in the 1990s, um, a more conservative individual from outside of the political process, but at least unless or until Caruso decides to run, I thought you made an interesting point about Joe Buscaino, who is not a Republican, but he's clearly the most conservative of the field. And actually what I should say, since we're talking about the field, is in addition to the four most prominent candidates, Bill Carrick's candidate, Jessica Lal, is a very interesting community and business leader. Mel Wilson is the San Fernando Valley business leader. Craig Gruy is a, a community activist as well. So there are also all sorts of interesting voices in the race beyond the top tier. But if at least for a moment we look at that top range of candidates, this guy, you know, is the most conservative of the group. And he clearly sees an avenue, as you were saying, Conan, on the issues of homelessness and crime and public safety to chart a much more a starkly different path than the rest of the front than the rest of the top tier of the field. Karen Bass, Mike Fuhr, Kevin DeLeon are all in very different ways fairly traditional and respected progressives. Uh, Bascaeno is coming at these two critical issues from a more aggressive position from the right. Will he will Buscaino's presence in the race force the other leading candidates to move rightward and begin coming down, if you'll excuse the verbal shorthand, begin sounding tougher on homelessness, tougher on crime than we expect than we've usually expected progressive leaders to do? Will Bus will Buscaino drag them over? Uh, my guess is no. I think one of the reasons Karen Bass decided to run was because uh, Mark Ridley Thomas uh, didn't run. And that was for obvious reasons now, but I think there was an assumption uh, that he was going to run for mayor. And when that didn't happen, uh, I think Karen Bass decided that this was an opportunity for her. Plus, um, she, she doesn't wanna be in the minority in the House of Representatives, as you know, Dan, there's no fun in that. Uh, she's, um, I, I think uh, her, you know, a, a, a Critic may say that her wings were clipped when it came to, to statewide office uh, or a U.S. Senate seat, at least, uh, because of um, the the her her, her past comments uh, with regard to Fidel Castro. I mean, there's a possibility that uh, nationally her chances were diminished because you got to win Florida in a presidential election. So um, I, th I think. Uh, in the sweepstakes to be Joe Biden's vice president, that hurt her. But that I, I do believe that she, in her heart, she saw somebody like Buscano as taking us back to 1990s Pete Wilson, um, three strikes, uh, tough on crime and tough on homelessness. Uh, and that's not, she, as a progressive, that's not what she wants. She believes that as we've seen in uh, in, in her news conference uh, just the other day, uh, she believes there's an avenue to sort of build our way out of this. 15,000 um, shelters, not sure if it's, per, it's permanent supportive housing or if it's temporary uh, emergency housing. She didn't, from what I understand, she didn't stipulate on exactly where she stood on that debate. But um, I, I, so I, I don't think you're gonna move. I think, I think both Karen and Kevin DeLeon are going to go uh, at each other for the progressive vote. Right now, from the polling that I've heard, uh, they, they do poll well, and everybody else is in single digits. Uh, and th that, um, you know, the, the more candidates get into this race, I think the better off they see their chances of making the runoff. And that's exactly, and that of course is the game right now, is, is making it uh, past June. Uh, so I, I don't suspect, uh, unless there's research, unless they get any kind of polling data that, that, in my opinion, that tells them that this, this let's build more housing is resonating with the public. Because frankly, uh, if uh, and I'd be interested in, in listening to uh, some of the questions or the people that are watching this, it's all anybody's talking about. It's all it. That's the number one issue. And I have to tell you. Uh, Jane Lynch, the actress, sent out a tweet uh, just today that said, LA is gone to, and I'll 
excuse the four letter word but begins to at, begins with s uh you look at the uh the boxes at railroad uh, at outside union station just a complete uh, this dystopia uh along the railroad tracks and it's all anybody talks about they want to see something done and we have been at it for so long and it continues to get worse that they don't believe uh, I think the city hall has lost so much credibility on the issue that maybe Joe Biscano has an opportunity. But my my guess is that um, uh, neither Kevin De Leon or um, uh, or Karen Bass, other than tone, you may see a shift in tone, but in terms of policy, they're not going to change. Really interesting. And let's talk about Kevin De Leon for a second, because as you may have seen, and I'm guessing most of the people in our audience have seen fascinating story in this morning's Los Angeles Times, in which De Leon, who has devoted a huge amount of time and effort, not just in terms of legislation, but in terms of deploying his staff to try to provide assistance to the homeless in his district, is now facing criticism from homeless community activists for not being compassionate enough. And so it seems like there is still a very strong leftward pull, even on a progressive like De Leon, to move further leftward. On the other hand, it also seems like among the broader electorate, as you were saying earlier, Conan, there's a broader impatience on this issue, which might require a more forceful approach. How does a progressive candidate, how does any candidate navigate those two, poll, the, the, those two polls? Well, I, I think for somebody like, um, Joe Biscano and Rick Caruso, for that matter, and I think that's why that's the role A. Smith would play uh, as as the advisor and consultant for a Rick Caruso candidacy if it were to take place. You have to get the West Side and and progressives and progressives who own property um, into feeling that it's it's compassionate to vote for a tougher position. Uh, when the LAPD comes out with a crime stats yesterday or the other day and said that 30% of all homicides are in the homeless encampments, when you you, you try to adjust just the message saying it is not, uh, there, there there is no a compassion by letting people live in this squalor, by letting them, uh, the, the, the number of sexual assaults that take place in the homeless encampments is, is staggering. And so, there's a way, I think, uh, for Biscano and for uh, for Rick Caruso, if they wanted to, which obviously they would, uh, to try to talk a, a liberal constituency into voting for a tough on uh, a tough a, a a a a tougher approach to the homeless problem. I should point out, for example, Austin, Texas, very blue city. They had a they they had a, a municipal election on the issue of whether or not they should start taking down encampments and whether or not they should enforce the no camping laws. And that's a very liberal city and they and, and it voted yes in favor of it. Uh, and I, I even listened to a debate, uh, actually it wasn't a debate, it was just a conversation with a number of progressives. And one progressive said they were voting against the initiative, uh, but they hope it passes. Uh, and that gives you a, a, their hearts in one place, but they they can't they they can't uh, they can't stomach people passing out on their front lawn because of a drug overdose. The 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 number of people that are dying in the streets of Los Angeles, for example, from fentanyl abuse, uh, is is a is is quite astonishing. So in terms of messaging, you have to make it compassionate to get tough. And getting tough means you can't kick them off the sidewalk. You have to have a place for them to go but then they have to go there. Well, and you mentioned Austin, Texas, even closer to home, we can look up the coast to San Francisco, obviously a very, very progressive city where their mayor, London Breed, has declared it a state of emergency in the Tenderloin District, and among other things, is deploying more police officers uh, to try to uh, uh, deal with some of the homeless encampments and much of the open air drug use. So it reminds me, Conan, there was a, old saying back in the late 20th century uh, in Republican circles when crime was a very big issue. They used to say, a conservative, is a, a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged. What I hear you saying is that there may be a practical equivalent on the homelessness issue 
as the visibility not only worsens but spreads throughout the city. Is that part of this dynamic, just the growing geographic spread of the challenge? Uh, oh, the, the, there's no question about it. Just the growing. I mean, the uh, the um, you see it for, for for so many Angelinos. They see it every day. The, it's the visual attack takes place on a daily basis, and there's this sense of a quality of life that is completely diminished and is going south. And uh, and it 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 doesn't it it makes you feel uh, poorly about where you live which by the way is uh, the home of your primary investment, which is your home. It makes you feel poorly about this, the loss of community uh, and you don't feel good for them either. Uh, I, this, is, this is not a good place for them to be. And so uh, th there is a, um, th there's, an, there's an advocacy element to, uh, to the homeless issue. Um, and by the way, Gavin Newsom, you sp speak of San Francisco, Gavin Newsom knows all about this. Uh, because he, he tried a cash, a care, not cash program in dealing with the homeless crisis in San Francisco. Um, it, it went on for years, didn't work. I have a very quick story from somebody who works for the mayor, tells me that there was a woman uh, outside the UN Plaza, outside C the Civic Center Plaza in San Francisco, homeless woman with a big teddy bear, and she would wave to people on a daily, daily basis. Everybody knew her. And Gavin, when he got elected mayor, said, you know, she's homeless. I'm going to, you know, this will, as an example, we're going to reach out to her and find her a place. So he did, and he did everything he possibly could to get her off the street. When he left to become lieutenant governor, she was still there. It's a very, very difficult problem. Uh, and, and even in San Francisco, the biggest problem Gavin Newsom had was pushback from some of the very groups that were advocating for the homeless. Um, and, um, it, 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 and, and, you know, Michael Schellenberger, I don't know if you've uh, read his book, uh, San Francisco, he's an environmentalist. A, um, uh, he advised the Obama administration on environmental uh, policy. Uh, he makes the argument that they're not homeless encampments, they're open drug dens, and that we have, um, uh, we, we think that it's compassionate not to enforce drug laws, but, uh, but he argues it's just the opposite. And, and so uh, a long way of getting around the fact that uh, I, I think there's, there's messaging that can be done certainly on Biscano's part, but Karen Bass is probably right when she said people don't have a stomach for, a, for another 10-year plan. Uh, she said even in her message the other day that it's 15,000, she wants 15,000 homes and she wants to build them in the first year. And uh, we need to fast track and get around CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, getting around some of the building permit problems and, and because it's, it stands in the way, good luck with that. That's extremely difficult to do, but even she acknowledges it has to be done quickly. You have a window of opportunity with the public uh, and, and, um, and it's, it, some might argue it's already closed when it comes to this city hall and this mayor. So two, two things. One, in fairness, I told the old Republican joke about a liberal, a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged. In fairness, the Democratic rejoinder was a liberal is a conservative who's had kids. So these things go in both directions. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to ask you this. There, there was a poll that came out just this morning, Conan, which I found to be fascinating. And it's by the U.S. Uh, it's called the Menino Survey of Mayors. It's a poll not of voters but a poll of mayors nationwide. And it asked them how much control do they have over addressing and potentially solving the homelessness challenge in their communities. Get this, less than 20% of mayors think they have much control over the issue. Only 5% say that they have a great deal of control over the issue. Yet almost all said that they felt the voters held them accountable for the homelessness challenge in their in their communities. Are we setting unrealistic expectations for Los Angeles' next mayor by expecting him or her to yeah, solve but that's it? A, that's a great question. And uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, first of all, we both know that in the LA City Charter, the mayor has limited authority for one thing. Um, he does or she does uh, is empowered to appoint uh, the heads of 40 different agencies uh, and, of course, has the bully pulpit and all that. A lot of people don't appreciate the fact that there is judicial involvement in the uh, in, in the homeless issue, um, um, 
there has been action taken in the uh, in the courts that has required the city to allow for certain encampments in certain parts. There's a whole blueprint of or uh, uh, footprint of where tents are now allowed in downtown Los Angeles, and that's not because of the city council. It's not because of the mayor. It's because of uh, the court decision. It's also a statewide problem. Uh, and you know, the Schellenberger makes the argument that if you t if you if you talk to somebody who is either drug addicted or mentally ill, you'll find out that they have frequently um, they have several uh, case officers. Um, they from different agencies uh, that don't know about each other, uh, and again, that gets to the very labor intensive. So there's a there's a statewide bureaucratic uh, problem here. Uh, there is judicial involvement, and 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 I have to tell you, California has one out of every eight Americans. We have one out of every four um, one out of every four homeless individuals. And you know, some folks may be asking if whatever whatever the effort is to build new housing, uh, what's to keep more people from showing up? Even Eric Garcetti, uh, in arguing that, says that it's a it's a lifeboat that every time you take a bucket and bail out some of the water, it just fills back up again. And he was looking for help from the the state to change uh, things like the uh, the law pertaining to uh, conservatives conservatorship. Uh, and gravely disabled, uh, that currently for you to intervene on behalf of somebody who's mentally ill, they have to have essentially the knife to the throat. They have to be a threat to themselves or, or someone else. And so the only time that happens is when they're arrested and sent to jail, which is why the jail is the largest mental institution in the city or in the state. So yeah, I, I think it is asking a lot more than the mayor can, but the mayor has to, uh, I think people rightly see the mayor as an as an instigator, as an instrument for, for driving the issue and getting the change that needs to be made at the statewide level. Look, speaking of issues that mayors can't solve but need to address, we talked a little bit earlier about crime and public safety. And two things are remarkable to me, Conan. Number one, I look back at a lot of the news coverage, yours and others, yours and lesser news coverage than yours, from eight and a half years ago, when Eric Garcetti and Wendy Gruel ran against each other for mayor. And the issues that dominated that race were transportation, or oil drilling, or DWP costs. Criminal justice and homelessness were barely part of the conversation. And even a year ago, when George Gascon was elected district attorney, just a few months in the aftermath of the tragic deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, there was a very restorative uh, approach to the criminal justice discussion. And it's notable to me how quickly that debate has shifted, not only since Gruel and Garcetti ran, but even since last year. As voters become increasingly concerned about crime, we haven't talked about Mike Fury yet. Does a job like city attorney, does that kind of credential help someone like Fury in a debate over criminal justice? Uh, it, it may, although uh, some might argue he's vulnerable on that issue, because um, it, there will be a, a an argument made that the gang injunctions uh, actually proved uh, a a worthy vehicle uh, to help uh, reduce crime, and uh, he has sort of abandoned those, uh, and that uh, so. I, I, I think I think you know Mike Fewer's biggest problem is that he is he um, is an individual who is uh, has not caught the attention of the of the public generally speaking. He doesn't have the wattage of either Karen Bass or Ke uh, Kevin De Leon, uh, and I think the the amount of publicity that um, his office received as a result of problems with uh, the Department of Water and Power. Um, uh, and a federal investigation as to whether or not his office acted appropriately. He'll point out that uh, it, it's, it did, uh, that there has been an indictment. But I, I think that um, he, he has not been able to uh, differentiate himself uh, to a large degree as someone who used his position as city attorney to help address the criminal uh, the, the crime problem. Keep in mind that the crime problem is largely outside his purview because it's we're talking felony uh, violence and murder and that kind of thing. The city attorney doesn't deal with any of that. 
uh, but but he has for the for most of his tenure, I think, uh, tried to see himself as a progressive city attorney, uh, somebody who was also part of the criminal justice reform movement, uh, which will bode you know, bode well for him with I think many of the progressive voters of the city. But they're they're probably going to be looking at the top two candidates uh, other than him before they get down to him. Uh, and so it, it'll be interesting to see how he's able to. I know he wants debates. Uh, I think Mike is going to be somewhat aggressive uh, because he's a, nobody's fool. He's a very smart guy uh, and he's got experience uh, in the legislature and the city hall and running for city attorney. Uh, so I, 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 he's he's I think he's going to do whatever he can to break into the to the uh, obviously to the. Uh, top two by the by the time June rolls around. I'm not sure how he's going to be able to differentiate himself though, on the on the issue of criminal justice. I um I moderated a debate between Mike Fuhr and uh, Carmen Trutanich eight years ago when they ran against each other. And if my memory serves me right, I think we might have had to mop blood off the floor by the time the two of them were finished were finished going <laughs> at each other. Um, one one more question to you, Conan, and then uh, I will yeah. in our our audience members with their questions. Um, we spoke earlier about how Buscaino taking a more centrist or perhaps conservative position on homelessness seems to be doing the same thing on criminal justice. Rick Caruso, should he run, has already indicated in some of his public statements that a tougher approach to crime would be part of, of his agenda. Um, does the discussion move in that direction or do you think the progressives, uh, De Leon and Bass and Fear, are able to focus the public's attention on other issues that would be higher priorities for them and their and their supporters. In other words, does crime emerge as an issue uh, it, at the level of homelessness, or does the dis discussion shift to issues on which progressives uh, generally tend to focus? Well, it, it, I think it, it all depends on uh, on Karen Bass's ability and De Leon's ability to message in such a way that those issues continue to resonate uh, with a very progressive. Remember, uh, the city is much more liberal than it was when Eric Garcetti and Wendy Gruel ran. And uh, and it's certainly much more liberal than when Richard Reardon ran. So uh, I, I think it's, it, it's, uh, it's up to how they can navigate uh, those two issues. Uh, uh, Karen Bass could be vulnerable on this. Remember that in Congress, she was all about police reform. Uh, and it was about uh, it, 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 her focus was not on crime. It was on the, the policing. And she's not somebody who comes across as being extremely comfortable uh, with uh, the, uh, the the fact that there is a, um, a return to uh, embracing law enforcement, as we've seen in so many of the cities, because, you know, I, I, I remember talking to the former police chief uh, of Los Angeles, so uh, Bill Bratton. Um, who predicted this? Uh, he said, yes, you're going to, I mean, we went through, after George Floyd, we went through the most, uh, never in the history have we seen so much anti-police protesting and demonstrating, and this, uh, and culturally, there was just this movement against policing. And some cities actually tried to get rid of their police departments. And so uh, he, I remember talking to him, and he says, this, this, I, I'll tell you what this will do. Uh, this will backfire. You, uh, there is a ProPublica piece in the Atlantic uh, uh, done by uh, his name will come to me in a moment, but it was about the Baltimore Police Department uh, after the Freddie Gray incident and how the, the the department, you know, they just said, we don't have the support of the mayor. We don't have support of the community. Uh, we're, we will respond when we hear a 911 call, but there's no um, proactive policing taking place number of police officers left skyrocketed. Uh, it left younger officers with less experience. There was a drain of the command staff. And there's a school of thought that says Alec McGinnis, that was the uh, writer for the ProPublica, that that's what happened nationally. That just sort of expanded to other cities. So it is a problem I don't think Karen Bass anticipated or Kevin DeLeon that they have to now have to answer the question that people are being shot and murdered in neighborhoods at an alarming rate. They can't, it's difficult for them, frankly, to say, well, listen, the crime rate, the murder rate is far less than it was in the 1990s, which is true. Uh, compared to the 1990s, we would, we would have, you know, back then we would have loved this crime rate 
uh, compared to what we were seeing. But remember, that crime rate uh, started to go down because of three strikes and the federal crime bill, both of which they say were horrible, uh, it, it over, over, overreach by the, by the voters and by the federal government. So uh, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, listen, crime went down, but then you, you were opposed to why it went down. So I, I, I truly believe when I, there are fundamental issues, and that relates to your home, and uh, your feeling of, of safety and, and what you think about the future of your city. Do you think the city's on the right track? And, and you know, you can always ask the Ronald Reagan question, which is, are you better off today than you were four years ago? If you agree with that, then you can vote for Jimmy Carter. But if you aren't, then you have to consider a change. Now, you don't have an incumbent in this race, but the, the question that somebody like Joe Biscano would say is that, listen, We've had this policy in terms of the homeless for, for a long time. If, if it's improved, then you should vote for those who've articulated that policy and want more of it. But if it hasn't, then we need we need a shift. Uh, in, and and I, I must say that even the, the mayor of Sacramento, Daryl Steinberg, uh, has, was also somebody who's championing this right to housing. This uh, and. It, Mark Ridley Thomas was part of uh, the team that uh, counseled the, go the governor on this issue. Even that is 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 designed to have a carrot and stick approach. You need a place for these people to go, but once you have one, they have to go. They don't have the option. And and there are homeless advocacy groups who who do not buy off on that. Uh, so I I I, I think it's all about homelessness. I think it's quality of life. I think it's crime. Those are the three issues that are gonna drive this election. And yes, by the way, it, Wendy Gruel and Eric Garcetti, it was IBEW, remember Local 17, I believe it was IBEW endorsed Wendy Gruel. And, uh, and it, for some reason that became the big story that they were, that uh, you know, the, the, the head of the union were going to run City Hall because they, uh, because they were, and it made Eric Garcetti into the more moderate candidate, which was, you know, the folks at the Chamber of Commerce scratched their head over that one. But, but yeah, no, it's, it's funny how things change. That was a, that was a long time ago, and it's a very different city than it was then. It, it certainly is, and plenty of issues that we'll be discussing over the course of the spring with all the candidates. Busca Eno in February, Fuhrer in March, uh, De Leon, Bass, and some of the others later in the spring. And we will talk, in addition to homelessness and crime, we will talk transportation. We will talk uh, DWP. We will talk quality of life issues. Um, so I hope you'll stick around for that series as an audience. But for now, what we'd like to do is, Claire, if you're willing to, to, to come and join us, um, Luna and I are going to take some questions from the audience if, if you have some, and I'm guessing that you do. Yes, we have a lot of questions, and we'll pick up right where you both left off on the topic of police and crime. So this person asks, are the more progressive candidates, such as Karen Bass, still promoting any messaging around defunding the police? If not, do they risk alienating the far left constituency that they likely need to win? Conan, I'm not aware that any of the uh, no, she, leading candidates have, have, have advocated defunding the police, but maybe you can talk a little bit about, about where they come down on the issue and progressive potential criticism that they would get from progressives about uh, not being uh, more advocate, not, not, not more devoted to more aggressive reform. Yeah, right. I, Karen Bass uh, it will steadfastly refuse to. Uh, she, she is. She will say she's never advocated defunding police, and she's very aware that Democrats got absolutely excoriated on that issue uh, in the in in the last election. Um, they. It's one of the reasons why um, they didn't do nearly as well as they expected. When Joe Biden got elected, they lost seats in the House and they have a razor thin majority in the House. And their research showed that defund police was the reason, uh, despite the fact that uh, members such as Karen Bass says nobody's asking us to defund the police. But the very liberal, very left uh, wing of their party sort of dominated the space on that topic. And of course, you had the 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 pro tests and, and votes in cities such as uh, Minneapolis. And they realized, oh, man, this messaging got out there. They, they kind of poo-pooed it. 
but the research told them that it was a it was a disaster. So, uh, I, and Karen Bass will definitely tell you that there's there's no way she wants to defund police, especially in the when she realizes that we have uh, a a a crime problem. Kevin DeLeon will say the same thing. It's all about criminal justice reform, actually doing better with policing. Uh, they'll make the argument that that police officers don't want to be doing the social work that we've required. That we we ask them to do too much. That that. You'll hear that from her. You'll hear that from him. I don't see in any way, shape, or form them uh, them tacking to the left on that issue. Uh, I, I think most progressives um, believe that 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 their heart is on the right place when it comes to climate change, when it comes to uh, you know the, the opportunities, uh, equal opportunities uh, in raising uh, neighborhoods of color uh, and disadvantaged neighborhoods and spending spending more to get at the root causes of crime. I think most progressives get that. Uh, they also get, though, that 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 train has left. There's no way anybody's going to get elected in any city, regardless of how liberal it is, saying you're going to defund police. In Minneapolis, they voted on it, and it didn't happen. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I, 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 I believe right now they have to tag. They have to be sensitive to the progressive wing, but they have to win over the valley. They have to win over homeowners. They have to live over, win over those who think that the wheels are coming off the wagon. Our heart's in the right place, but we're not doing, we're not doing ourselves any good by driving everybody to Thousand Oaks. Very interesting. So this next question is a two-part question about the general position of a uh, mayor in Los Angeles. So this person asks, is there any candidate for whom the actual job of being mayor in LA is important in its own right versus a stepping stone to a larger, more glamorous position? What changes could we attempt to make to attract people who really want to work for the city without an eye on the national political stage? Oh, so Conan, um, the, the irony of that question is that even though many potential mayors see the office as a stepping stone, unless you count Garcetti going to be ambassador to India sometime later this year, no mayor in modern history of Los Angeles has ever gone on to a higher office. Vita Ragosa and R R Reardon ran for governor. Um, Sam Yorty years ago ran briefly for president. But I can't think of an LA mayor that's gone on to higher office. Am I missing someone? Uh, no, in fact, I don't think in the history of the city uh, that's ever happened. Uh, mm -hmm. There has been, um, a, 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 right? Hiram Johnson was the mayor of San Francisco. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's uh, it, being a mayor in this city is sort of a dead end uh, based on what we've seen. It's one of the reasons why Eric took that job. Uh, in India, I believe, is that it was the only one out there, uh, and uh, and there's a there's it, there's a good reason for it. I mean, it, you know, it, it gets him out of the it, it gets him out of the political mainstream for the for a time being. Let's let's let the dust settle. It reminds me of when Jerry Brown ran for U.S. Senate after he was governor for two terms and he lost, uh, and they asked him uh, against Pete Wilson. And they asked him, how do you feel? He says, well, you know, it's obvious that the voters are tired of me. And quite frankly, I'm kind of tired of them. So uh, maybe it's time for a break. So <laughs> Eric uh, Garcetti is getting a break, I think, by going to India. So, no, I, I have to tell you this one thing, though, uh, since we since the uh, question question brought this up. When you saw a change, and Dan, you know this, in term limits, um, th that started a, a dramatic change in City Hall. And, well, it wasn't dramatic. It was slow. Uh, some have called it the sacramentalization of city government. And that is the, the traditional city councilman was somebody not quite unlike the late Tom LaBonge, who uh, it was all constituent services, potholes. You know, if the neighborhood was upset with the Live Nation concert outside uh, the Greek theater, he'd be out there afterwards picking up trash, you know, and 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 watching to see how the crowds behaved and where the police were. I mean, that was being a city councilman then, or council person. He wasn't doing global issues. He wasn't doing climate change. He wasn't doing, you know, he wasn't, they weren't passing resolutions on, uh, you know, on uh, the Ukraine and the Soviet, and the Soviet Union. So uh, that started to change when, because of term limits, legislators ran out of places to go in Sacramento. So they started running for city, city council. 
And that's why you had Antonio Viragosa there and Herb Wesson there and Kevin DeLeon's there now. And and if you talk to some of the old guard, they'll tell you that it's it, the, the institution's changed. Uh, and you, you don't have the kind of uh, city councilmen, uh, city council people that you used to have. And uh, and it's become, you know, they, they have a, uh, a, a global perspective. Uh, David Axelrod, uh, once said that whenever he had the, the consultant for Barack Obama, whenever he had a mayoral candidate, he always said, uh, be as expansive as you want to be, but always make sure you pick up the trash. Uh, mm -hmm. And and in, in some places, I mean, San Francisco is the worst place for that. The Board of Supervisors, my God, they're they're It's it's all global to them. Uh, but so so I, I think. Part of the problem with term limits, frankly, there's a downside to everything. There's an upside to it. It got a lot of people in in the process that wouldn't be in the process. But one of the problems was you had people that used to be focused on statewide policy, and now, they, they're, now they're out. They go to a city council, and they're still focused on statewide policy, and they, they don't get city politics. They don't get city, li city quality of life. And that's one of the arguments about Karen Bass and Kevin DeLeon, by the way. They've never run anything. As a as the as the mayor, you run a huge bureaucracy, uh, and they have not been tied to the municipal problems very very long. I mean, they've been in Washington and Sacramento for the longest time, and I think I think you'll hear that from some of the other candidates. Well, that leads very nicely into this next question, which which might be tricky for either of you to to answer, but this person asks. Who is the most qualified to be mayor of Los Angeles? Conan, I'll let you go first on this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it, it, one one of the um, one of the things that Karen Bass has going for, her, and uh, we'll talk about her first, is that she has demonstrated leadership uh, in Sacramento and in Washington. She's a very bright woman. Uh, she has uh, worked hard at the grassroots level when she was in Southern California uh, and, and, and essentially building a career. Uh, she is able to uh, talk to people on the other side of the aisle. Famously, Karen Bass is friends with Kevin McCarthy. I think they still are. Uh, they knew each other in the legislature. Uh, and so there's, uh, there's, no, there's no substitute for personal relationships. Uh, and when it comes to leadership, uh, she has that quality. Uh, she has that quality. I think Kevin DeLeon uh, as well. You don't rise to the rank of Senate President Pro Tem without your ability to understand your members and meet them where they are and work on their behalf as well as negotiate with even people that you don't really want to negotiate with. So they have those qualities. And there's a lot of that as mayor of Los Angeles, working with the city council, but also everybody from the local congressional delegation on federal policy, uh, state, statewide policy that affects you. So they have those qualities. They have the downside, of course, as I mentioned, is that they haven't run anything big. Um, and of course, there's Joe Biscano has, has more experience in city government than either one of them. Uh, and he knows uh, a little bit about where the bodies are buried. That may, by the way, be part of the problem for him, though. He's part of an he's part of a body uh, that uh, you know three members are either in federal prison, have an FBI under indictment, uh, or on trial. Uh, and the you know there's a there's a concern that uh, that C City Hall. I have to tell you, when Jose Weizar was arrested. Uh, eventually, the Department of Justice and the and the U.S. Attorney for Los Angeles said, you know, we would have appreciated if somebody at City Hall had dropped a dime on us on this, that this was happening. His case is now being adjudicated, but this is happening, and nobody in City Hall knew anything that there were, that there weren't problems with the Planning and Land Use Commission uh, uh, committee and and the uh, the fact you had developers that were giving you know kickbacks. So. Uh, Joe Biscano has his own concerns, I think, being uh, a member of a city council and city hall that a lot of people view as simply corrupt. Uh, so um, I, I think uh, they all bring their own um, uh, their own advantages uh, personally to the job. Uh, Dan, you've worked for candidates in the past. This 
is this is a, a a mayoral job is one where you really don't want to be learning on the job. But the fact of the matter is that's inevitable to a certain degree based on the number of people who are going to be who are running for this position. Yeah, I, I think the best way to answer that question is with the question: What do you define as qualified? Now, the last uh, the, the last two mayors had both been president of the LA City Council, and in those cases the uh, voters of Los Angeles decided that local government, that council experience was sufficient, even though Eric Arcetti and Antonio Vitaragosa had never held an executive position. Jim Hahn, of course, had been city controller and city attorney. So he held local government office, but like Mike Fuhrer, an executive position rather than a member of the council. Dick Reardon had never held public office. And we talked about the parallels between his candidacy and if Rick Caruso decides to run a little bit earlier, Tom Bradley, if you go back that far, had been a city council member for some time before running for mayor. So if you look back at the last 50 years, there's only a subset of five to draw from, but I don't know that there's a lesson that you can take from that. And I just wanna pick up really quickly on a point that Conan made. In campaigns for president of the United States, voters tend to look for outsiders particularly when they're unhappy with the way government's functioning. Joe Biden is the first political insider to get elected president, I would argue, since George H.W. Bush in 1988. Angelinos generally look to people who do know how local government works, but it is worth wondering and watching if the scandals that have beset City Hall in recent years do change that equation. So different voters are gonna judge qualified in very, very different ways. And I don't know that I can predict right now whether Angelinos will make the same kind of decision that they did for Vita Ragosa or Garcetti, which would be good for, for Kevin DeLeon or for Buscaino, if they make the same kind of decision that they did for uh, Mike Fuhr, excuse me, for Jim Hahn, which would be good for Fuhr, or if they pick an outsider which would be of some benefit to a candidate like Karen Bass or possibly Caruso. That'll be one of the fascinating things about the next few months. And Claire, if you don't mind, that leads me to a yet another shameless plug for our mayoral series. And when Bess Cayeno joins us on February 15th, here the month after that and the rest later in the spring, I think that's a fascinating question to ask them as to why they think they're more qualified than their opponents and let them answer the question better than either Conan or I can. Uh, Claire, we did start a few minutes late because of the technical issues, so maybe we can cram in one more question before we call it a day? Yeah, absolutely. So as you both have predicted, homelessness is going to be a huge um, issue for the candidate to address and also a huge issue that our audience is really interested. So there's a ton of questions about how the mayor the future mayor can um, address this issue as well. I'll only pick one, um, but a, a sort of repeated theme is how can the mayor build short-term housing quickly when neighborhoods are opposed to such housing in their areas? Uh, well, remember, one of the debates is uh, is the debate over short term versus long term. I mean, Eric Garcetti signed off on the long term long term support of housing, uh, and uh, and his problem has been uh, a twofold. Dan, uh, you would know as well. Um, not only are there the not in my backyard uh, uh, crowd, but there is the you know, as as uh, as the former radio talk show host. Uh, uh, Doug McIntyre wrote in the Daily News, it's hard to build cheap housing on expensive land. And um, and that's been also part of the problem with measure HHH is the amount of money that's been going into building a, not all that many permanent supportive housing units at an astronomical price. Um, so that's, that, that's been a problem. I, I also think though that yes, neighborhoods are not interested in uh, this housing being built in their in their uh, community. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. One of which though is that I, I don't believe that e even in in some very progressive liberal areas, they they trust the city government. Uh, if a councilman says this is temporary housing, they don't believe that. 
they believe that it's permanent housing. There's no such thing as temporary anymore. And, and I think that part of the problem with measure HHH and measure, measure H, one was a tax hike for 10 years to help with uh, support the, the efforts to get the homeless off the street. The other is to build housing. They believe that money has not been used appropriately. They don't believe that the money has been uh, tracked appropriately. And, and I think City Hall has lost, lost credibility on that issue. And that doesn't help when it comes to trying to find a place to put some of this housing. Dan, what do you think? Boy, I, th I think you touched on a particularly important point, which is the lack of trust that LA voters have in their elected officials at every level, local, county, state, to solve this issue. One of the books I assigned to my classes at SC and at Cal and at Pepperdine is a terrific book called Notes from the Cracked Ceiling. And while it's a book in particular about female political leadership, there's a lot of lessons in there that I think are beneficial to leaders of both genders in all fields. And there's a great line in the book saying, you got to slay a dragon. You got to slay a dragon. If you want voters to believe you, if you want voters to trust you, you've got to demonstrate to them that you can fulfill a promise. And so I feel like whoever is the next mayor of Los Angeles, whoever he or she turns out to be, at the very beginning of the term, they got to slay a dragon maybe a smaller dragon than homelessness, but show to the voters, when I make a promise, I mean it, and build a degree of credibility that gives the voters more confidence that the bigger issues like homelessness are, are solvable also, if not in the immediate, that's not gonna continue to go on interminably. Little wins lead to big wins. And I think you know, a good lesson for leaders, like I said, in every field, is to demonstrate confidence and success somewhere and that gives you the ability to move, for, move forward on the bigger stuff. So De Leon and Fuhrer and Bass and Buscaino and Lowell and Wilson might all pick a different dragon to slay in the first month of their term, but no one's gonna trust them on homelessness until they can demonstrate credibility on something else first. And to me, that's the way the next leader, Mayor, LA's next leader ought to be thinking about how to build the trust so that we can move forward to deal a pro, a pro, with a problem that, like we said earlier, that a mayor can fix on his or her own. So the trust and credibility comes first, the solutions come second. Claire, I know we're a few minutes over, um, but before you bring Kim back on, can I beg your indulgence for one quick moment? Absolutely. Um, before Kim has a chance to say it for herself, I received an email from her earlier in the program saying that in fact, and I have to admit, I didn't know this, a man by the name of William Stevens was mayor of Los Angeles for two weeks in 1909 after his predecessor, Arthur Harper resigned and his successor, George Alexander was sworn in. And after this gentleman, uh, William Stevens became mayor in 1909, he went on eight years later to serve for six years as governor of California. So in fact, Conan, we stand corrected. Even though he was only mayor for two weeks, yeah. our friend Bill Stevens did pull it off. <laughs> Conan? Yeah, no, uh, is, is, is actually coming back to me. I, somebody told me that once before and I completely, uh, I completely forgot. Listen, uh, thank you very much for having me. I, I, let me make this one point. I don't know if you did this uh, earlier, Dan, but one of the things that we love about this mayoral election is that we're talking about city politics again. Uh, during the Trump administration for that period, uh, Washington took all the oxygen out of the room when it came to politics. People have just a finite amount of interest in politics, and it was all Washington. We stopped seeing much out of City Hall. Ed Lee, the, mayor, the late mayor of San Francisco, even told a buddy of mine who worked for him, "Nobody's watching us. You know, we can get it. We can do whatever we want because all the all the all the attention is focused on Washington. Well, attention is focused on LA City Hall again, and on this mayoral race. And the city charter has changed, so we're going to have a lot more people voting on it. It's going to be the marquee race. It's going to be very exciting. And I was delighted to be uh, to here with you talking about it. And, and Conan, but despite our mutual unforgivable faux pas in overlooking." William Stevens. I can't tell you how terrific it was to have you <laughs> with us today. 
We're very grateful to you for your time and your expertise. And for those of you who don't watch Conan on KNBC, you should, not only on the nightly news, but on Sunday morning. So Conan, thank you so much for being here tonight to share your wisdom with us. We're really grateful to you. The, the pleasure is all mine. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Kim, are you gonna, uh, is, is Kim rejoining us or am I winding up? I'm people? here, Conan. We so much appreciate your time. We have to have you back. That was such an informative and lively discussion. And there's so much at stake here in this election. So thank you so much for your expertise. You're very You're kind. Again, I love the World Affairs Council and uh, and I'll be happy. Just, just let me know. Thank you, Conan. So Dan, we should remind everybody again that if they wanna hear more about the 2022 mayoral race, they need to join us at 6.30. February 15th, it will be at the beautiful eBell of Los Angeles, which is our venue partner. We're so appreciative of them offering us this consistent series at that beautiful campus. And of course, February 1st, Dan is back with the Dan Schnur Political Report. And Claire is probably working as we speak to get, we have about a half dozen fabulous live stream and in-person events that you'll see posted on our website, hopefully over the next few days. Next week on Monday, we have Inside Capitol Hill, a key 2021 legislative uh, priorities list discussion with Washington expert, John Russell. And uh, Friday of next week, we have a partner program with the American Council on Germany with German pol uh, politician, Sigmar Gabriel and Ambassador John Emerson, who you all have enjoyed before as a moderator. So check our website out in a day or two, and we can't wait for you to join us again. Dan, this was fabulous. Thank you so this much. This was a lot of fun. I look forward to seeing you on February 1st for the webinar and on February 15th for our interview with Joe Butzkayano to kick off our Mero series. Thanks, everyone. Have a good, good evening. Night.